Thank you, everyone, for coming to this session, our 2022 Interregional Hub convening uh, for the Plant Health Annual Meeting. So my name is Jeremy Pivor. I'm the Senior Program Coordinator at the Plant Health Alliance, and I help lead our Regional Hub program. Let's see if this clicker works. There we go. So we have quite a packed agenda. First, I'll give a brief introduction of our regional hub program. We'll have lightning talks from each of our regional hub travel scholar representatives, some who are here today with us in person and some who are online. We'll have some talks from PHA partner organizations as well. Why don't you all come in and take a seat? Who have their own communities of practice. We'll do a brief Q&A for all interested parties of those people and then we're going to really go into the meat of the discussion, which will be inter-hub breakout discussions. And finally, we'll report back and close. So the PHA Regional Hub Network, why regional hubs? So the essence of it is bringing global to local and local to global. As we all know, planetary health is a very large topic, but it, can be very, it needs to be very contextual at the local scale and the regional scale. And so regional hubs bridge, act as bridge, bridges that act as communities of practice, creating a mosaic that is context specific in different regions. Planetary health in Europe is very different than planetary health in East Asia and very different planetary health in Oceania. But we all have to work together. So in real terms, what does these hubs mean? They help PHA members find their neighbors to partner and push planetary health forward whether that's in research, education, policy, movement building, or other domains. And finally, it's finding communities within communities. And that's for me in the past few years what I've been the happiest to see while leading this program of seeing the networks and the relationships that have been born from these. So a little bit about the network. In 2019 and 2020, these hubs actually grew organically from individuals and with the assistance of the Planetary Health Alliance. And in 2021, we worked together with those hubs to really see, okay, how can we build cohesion and capacity? So we worked together with them to develop some structure to increase that. And we formed these 10 hubs based off the existing ones. And these 10 hubs, the regionality, it's not random. It's based off the regions of the SDGs and the UN and the regionality of how they construct that. And we want to make sure we recognize the differences, though, of culture, language, and other factors, which is why we also have a branching model, a branch hub model, where, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have East Africa Hub and West Africa Hub. And so this is not a restriction. It's just a base of form organization. And before I move into the next part, I want to introduce uh, two people. Sandeep Maharaj, who's sitting back there, please stand up. He's our Global Outreach Fellow. He's been with the PHA longer than I have and is an expert in the regional hubs. And we also have, I'm not sure if she's online, but Joshitha, who's our Junior Outreach Fellow. Yeah, Joshitha Sankam, there she is. Joshitha, do you want to turn your video on? And so Joshitha will be our junior outreach fellow who will learn from Sandeep and help lead our hubs forward. So now I want to move to our regional hub travel scholars. We have seven of them with us, either here in person or online. We have Munga, Mesara, Emmanuel, Mary, Donald, Raquel, and Jennifer. And first, I'd like to hear from Given Munga. He's going to share about his hub and what they're doing, and brief talks. And Given, I believe, is online with us, too. If we can switch to the Zoom. Perfect. Thanks. Um, thanks for hosting this meeting today. Um, and greetings to you all. I would have loved to be with you here in Boston, but I couldn't. Um, but I'm happy that I can join uh, this session uh, today. So I represent the Planetary Health Eastern African Hub. Um, my name, like introduced by Jeremy, I'm um, uh, Given Monga. And so the, um, the Eastern African Hub um, is a movement working locally and regionally with health professionals, academic experts from several universities, um, research institutions, and uh, local and uh, 
international NGOs are within the Eastern African region. They have aims at strengthening our regional community building, providing education uh, for transformative action, influencing our policy as, as well. Um, like already mentioned not too long ago that we established our hub, it was launched in 2020 uh, with support from uh, the German Alliance for Climate Change and Health and other. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main focus um, for activities within the region, but we also extend uh, beyond this region. So we look at countries like within Kenya, Zambia, Rwanda, Sudan, Africa. Ah, okay. Probably I'll just mention again to get is that the aim of the hub is really to strengthen regional uh, community and uh, within the education uh, sector, um, building collaborative work. Uh, with uh, NGOs uh, and other partners within, within the region. I had also mentioned that we launched our hub in 2020 with great support from the German Alliance for uh, Planetary, oh, sorry, from Climate Change and Health Group uh, and uh, other partners. And we are working within Kenya, the Eastern African region, but also beyond to countries like uh, Zambia, Madagascar, uh, Tanzania, Uganda. Uh, probably I should mention also um, our vision beyond um, this meeting going forward. Um, we hope to continue working on our strategic uh, projects, one of which is the SOFIA project, which is uh, strengthening one and health in the Eastern African uh, region. This is a project funded uh, by the um, DAD. And um, it, it's, a, it's a project that we're working with three universities, um, Wolfsburg University in, in, in Germany, and also the Catholic University of Health and Allied Science in uh, Tanzania, uh, as well as Eldridge University in, in Kenya. And the aim of the project is to explore, investigate, and teach, and act, and increase our climate and environmental uh, health knowledge, uh, addressing the challenges uh, with the interaction uh, with, within human um, health, animal health um, as well. And we hope beyond this uh, annual meeting that we can extend um, our reach to other countries within the region and build strategic partnerships also outside the Eastern African um, region. We hope to do more in research as well, building evidence and also having more work with the communities within, within the region. We also um, hope that we can be a central voice within the region um, that will speak on the need to act agently uh, with respect to the uh, planetary health um, aspect. And also we hope uh, to make um, planetary health more popular within the medical community. Um, and we have strategic steps now to help have the planetary health within medical curricula within, within the region. And we also hope to continue building youth leadership um, by having you know, more campus ambassadors from the region and also having strategic programs where we encourage youths uh, to participate. Um, as you, as I, I must mention as I end, that this is really a, um, a hub run by young people. One of my um, colleagues is there with you, Norvin. I'm sure you'll hear us speak as we go on in these, these meetings. And we hope to have more young, young people come on board uh, so that we can build strong networks within, within the region, but also uh, encourage that the young people can take leadership now and also uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. And as we convene in this meeting, uh, I want to wish you the best and that we can have good interaction and see how together from different um, um, places where we can come from, where we're coming from, I uh, can continue to do uh, work that is agently needed. I thank you all. Thank you, Given. If we can move back to the slides, Maysara, if you can please come up to the podium. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Maysara from uh, Malaysia, representing Southeast Asia and South Asia Hub. Very excited to be here, and it's lovely finally being able to see um, some of the people that we've been interacting virtually and now seeing in person, you know, Jeremy, for example. So thanks so much for this opportunity to share a little bit of what um, we've been doing in the regional hub of Southeast Asia and South Asia. So 
Um, first and foremost, maybe let me just preface by acknowledging that planetary health in itself is relatively new, but it's much, much newer in the region. Um, but at the same time, it's been rapidly gaining traction. You know, for example, in Malaysia, where I'm from, planetary health has been mentioned in the National Development Plan, the National Budget, the, um, uh, and now also developing a National Action Plan on planetary health. And at the same time, there's also work being done in the Philippines and in Indonesia in building programs, capacity building programs, and integrating planetary health in the national um, education curriculum. So a lot of energy, um, a lot of excitement, but also with all this energy and you know, the novelty of the field in itself, it's somewhat presented a bit of an internal challenge, uh, if you know, I can admit um, here. It's um, in how, how do we identify now what are the highest uh, value-added areas that we should be working on. Um, and you know, we recently just had a regional hub convening, just maybe a couple of weeks back, and we've discovered that there's so much already work being done by a bunch of different people on various issues, but it's more about bringing everybody together. So that's sort of the role that we hope to um, be leading forward. And on you know, this, um, this challenge, we've sort of landed on three key areas that we hope to bring the regional hub forward. So first is um, in shifting governance, and that's in breaking silos, in uh, rethinking policies and norms, um, to welcome a more syst systemic approach. And you know, that starts from possibly presenting a regional landscape analysis of what everybody and whoever has been doing. Um, second is in communicating planetary health effectively, and especially in a world where attention is such a scarce commodity. So how do we put planetary health on top of um, people's agenda and on top of people's minds in general, in habits and practices? And then lastly is in, you know, the focus of, for us in Malaysia, um, but also, you know, in the region, is creating an education revolution. Because um, it's not enough to just do research, you know, just for research sake, and to have conferences where only academics sit at the table, so, so on and so forth. So that's what we hope to um, change moving forward, and really translating the research and whatever knowledge that we have uh, into the, uh, onto the ground where people are most affected. And as you know, you know, the Southeast Asia and South Asia Hub are the most vulnerable against um, the impacts. Um, also include, a large part of it is also including um, building the capacity and uh, building the evidence for um, youth, gen uh, youth engagement and building the next generation of planetary health leaders. So yeah, um, that's, that's it, I think. Uh, we're very, very looking forward to uh, exchanging and sharing knowledge with other regional hubs and everyone here too. Thank you. Thank you, Maysara. Emmanuel. Right, yes, good morning. Sorry that I tried to double task. Good morning once again, I'm Emmanuel Cummings, representing the Caribbean Regional um, Hub. Um, I'm, I'm also from Guyana, which is part of the Caribbean. I wish to indicate that the, the Caribbean Regional Health Hub was established in, in 2020. Um, it involves the University of Belize, University of Guyana, the Antem de Cum, University of Suriname, the Caribbean College. There are also other institutions that, that collaborate in the establishment of this hub. The Caribbean College of Family Physicians, Pahu WHO, the Trinidad Office, the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Center, UE Barbados, and the Caribbean Center for Health System Research and Development, which, which hosts the Secretariat of the Hub, and this is located in Trinidad and Tobago. Its vision of this hub is safeguarding optimal health for the Caribbean people and Earth natural systems. Its mission is to build an active, collaborative, and disciplinary planetary health community of practice to inspire and influence and guide Caribbean people to tend and protect ecosystems through policies and programs for sustainable and regenerative outcomes. Those are some of our missions. Our general goal is to serve as a regional leader in planetary health by generating and disseminating knowledge building relevant skills and creating public awareness and behavioral change among its people. And this can be achieved through research, education, and education 
where we can influence the curriculum of the tertiary institutions in, in the region to, make, to create greater awareness to planetary health and, and also change in behavior. One of the goals also is that in, in, the, in our own concept of, of planetary health, is this one health initiative where even though when we to look at the, at the, at the health, at, at the hub of itself, that is currently where we have most of our, our persons involved, they do have a health background, but, but our intention is to widen that to, to involve persons in other areas, the environmental sciences, you know, the issues of climate change, agriculture, the social sciences, so that we can have to look at the impact of planetary health from all perspectives, in integrating all of, the, all of the various professionals and what impact it has on health on our planet. But once one of the, since the establishment of, of this hub, there have been a number of activities that has taken place. We were able to um, do a conference, an international conference that this was done in collaboration with the Imperial College of London, and also research, which certainly Sandeep will speak about, um, has to do with the, the mapping of psychological issues faced by young adults in the Caribbean. And this was research that was done with respect to, to COVID-19. What were the psychological issues that affect young people um, during the, the COVID-19? And I said, Sandeep will speak much more about this. And this was then it involves Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad, and hopefully later we, we intend to include Jamaica. Um, we refer to this as the, the Climate Cares or Climate Change and Health Project. Some future works which we intend to do involves widening our scope, as I indicated, to, to track other professionals, conduct a mapping of personnel and Caribbean institution working in planetary health. We do feel that planetary health do exist, um, and many persons are unaware of it. And so the intention is to do a personal mapping of Caribbean institution that's working in planetary health, and a survey in collaboration with the Imperial College um, with climate change focusing on youths, which I did mention before. That is something which we've already done. Other um, work we intend to do in the future is to develop a research database um, on the survey in strategy, develop communication pieces explained planetary health for all different audiences. That's in the in CARICOM, focusing on, on um, the public and also for family health physicians. We also intend to provide evidence-based linkages of human health at, at its impact on the environment change, create new research and education programs, funding opportunities, and collaboration. So those, that's just in a, in a nutshell, some of the act activities that we're doing, and we're very pleased to be here and to learn much more from you and to share some of the work which we'd have done in this particular area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Can we switch to the Zoom, please? Next will be Mary from West Africa Hub. Okay. So good afternoon, colleagues. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, my name is Mary Ashinyo. I come from Ghana, and I represent the West Africa Hub. So listening to colleagues uh, who have spoken uh, about their hubs previously, I would say that the West Africa hub would be uh, one of the baby hubs, if I can call it that way. Uh, back in 2019, airports started to organize the West Africa hub. There are 17 countries in West Africa. So far, what we see is a resource of colleagues who are very, very willing and interested in coming together to advance their planetary health efforts within the hub. And so what I see as a critical need within the hub is how to get more organized. And so post-conference, our effort will focus on how to bring ourselves together and be more organized. How I envisage that we would do that would be to start with colleagues who are registered online in the high low community of practice who are from the West Africa region. And this will be an attempt to officially mobilize uh, members of the West African hub. I also envisage that we would need some framework that would guide our operations. Um, if I look at the 
Planetary Health Alliance versus how, let's say, similar public health associations are organized, I envisage that we might need a very simple um, framework that I don't want to call it a constitution, but something that guides how we operate. We would also need an initial uh, executive body to be able to coordinate these activities. Once we are able to do that, then we would develop an operational plan, which will be our key activities for the first year of organization. I envisage that in the first year of getting organized, most of our efforts will be centered around making an economic case for planetary health. I remember that uh, when we launched uh, planetary health back in 2017, and uh, when we started organizing school seminars for School of Public Health um, postgraduate students, um, they were always asking, uh, what is the evidence that planetary health is not a problem for America and Europe, but it's also a problem for Africa. And I like what Jeremy said at the beginning that planetary health has to be contextualized. So now we don't even have to prove that to people because of COVID uh, outbreak and also because of uh, contextual environmental health challenges such as Galamse, illegal mining, uh, polluting water bodies, which is very visible to people even before we present data or research evidence to them. So we think that that is a very good opportunity for us to mobilize people and get more organized and also be able to map up which stakeholders are working around planetary health. There are so many other stakeholders who are doing work in relation to planetary health. We will be able to map out some of these and what other activities are available and resources that are available for us to be able to leverage on. I envisage that once we are well organized, we may need to then properly launch the West Africa Planetary Health Alliance Hub. Uh, maybe we could do that in Ghana or any of the African countries that colleagues um, agree that we could do that. And I see that from there, we would be more able to do a lot into research, generating evidence to support planetary health within the West Africa region and et cetera, et cetera. So I think that for West Africa, we still have some baby steps to take to get more organized. And then we can do the big things that our other colleagues are doing in their hub. So I look forward to engaging with all of you. And so that uh, when we meet again, we would be able to share some of the great things that we envisage we can achieve within the West Africa Hub. Thank you and over. Is Donald Wilson in the room? Oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Donald Wilson. I represent the Oceania Hub, and I come from the Fiji National University. The Oceania Hub is, is made up of more than 30 organizations uh, at this stage from five countries, uh, Samoa, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and Australia and New Zealand. And as my colleagues from Malaysia and Ghana uh, had just alluded to, planetary health as a concept is relatively new in our parts of the world as well, particularly in the developing countries. And um, I guess especially while we are still trying to build strategies in the areas of echo health and one health, uh, given that there are some overlaps in these concepts. Um, so during COVID, I think one of the challenges we particularly went through was uh, the inability to, to test samples effectively. And one of the things I think we realized was our weaknesses in the areas of infectious disease research, as well as that weakness in, in capacity building in communicable disease and infectious diseases. So there are two projects, and so the focus, I think, of Oceania going forward at the moment is building capacity, uh, at, uh, as I speak, uh, is what we're doing in Fiji. And there are two programs or two fund funded projects that are currently running, um, and these are looking at um, improving human and environmental health. Uh, in One is in informal settlements, and we know that informal settlements will continue to, to expand in the coming years, and they started to say in, by 2050 that that will continue to increase by 40%. And uh, so one of them is called the RISE project, the revitalizing informal settlements and their environments. Uh, and this is what uh, one of the projects that we want to strengthen 
our capacity in, as well as the watersheds intervention for systems health, which aims to reduce infection and risk um, and improve health, well-being, and downstream ecosystem conditions within the watersheds in Fiji. So the way uh, we see ourselves doing this is, is by building upon some of these projects that we currently have and um, um, uh, build capacity, sorry, uh, for the Pacific. From the Fiji National University, the ability to train, because we train medical students and students from across the Pacific region, and being able to build that capacity is uh, by establishing a, a research hub. And the Planetary Health Oceania Hub has been very instrumental uh, also in assisting us uh, develop what we are through the Fiji Institute of Pacific Health Research uh, and look at regional approaches to sustainable health uh, in the Pacific. And we are intending that this is an action research hub that uh, helps network uh, people who are influential in this space in the Pacific and uh, particularly in our friends in Australia and New Zealand. And so these would include building capacity in ecological approaches uh, to uh, ecological, uh, sorry, to public health, uh, veterinary science, molecular research, and uh, the ability to build on the current investments that we have to be able to reach communities, uh, both in, in the rural communities as well as those in peri-urban areas. And, and we're looking forward also to be able to convene uh, a regional forum in 2023. It's just a short uh, update from the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Raquel? Are you listening to me well? Okay. First of all, I want to say that I'm very excited to see some of you f for the first time in person. And because of most of you we met in the last year in the Brazilian meeting, but just virtually. So uh, this year we decided, or I received this mission to put this rub again in, this hub again in working and going forward. So we started in maybe 2018 when we did the first, the first uh, model or the first time the Hilo group. And then at that time we have about uh, 20 groups or 20 uh, initiatives, initiatives from society or universities working together. And uh, we stopped to talk about that, then came the COVID, but before in 2020, we did, um, uh, we tried to reconnect people and in, in Latin America, we have uh, maybe 30 organizations in Brazil uh, and 12 from other places from Latin America. And uh, our purpose is establishing new relationships enabling learning and development and exchange uh, of skills and knowledge because we think we need to do this together all around the world, even respecting the regional, the cultures. Uh, it's important to make connections to uh, put this forward. Uh, in Brazil, we have a very interesting experience. Uh, we created a program, an ambassador program from Brazil that is made from undergraduate and graduate students. We have some uh, representatives here participating with us together uh, during this meeting. And the experience is very positive. The first, we, the first year we have more than 100 people around Brazil uh, talking about planetary health and talking about solutions to move this forward. And we are supposed to think about and talk with you, who is from Latin America and here, uh, to, to multiply or to do this program all around the Latin America. And other opportunities that we have to, uh, we are trying to do to connect people from Latin America is an opportunity that came from Professora Tatiana from south of Brazil, that she's here is on my one partnership with the foundation Nino and Nina to adapt and material about planetary health, uh, educational material from Alforja Educativa Salud Escolar. Uh, and we are trying to 
connect the adapted material to regional situations and groups to uh, improve this these relations and this uh, the 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 hub uh, and we really want to expand this uh, i listen here about from other places but the ambassador program i think it's a very very important in put the youth and young people involved in this uh, and this and then in the construction of this hub and uh, we really want to identify other groups from Latin America and here, individuals or organizations, to connect and put this. Uh, Brazil is so big, and Latin, Latin America bigger, and together I think we can get and do a lot of movements to improve the planetary health and the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, thanks. So, hi everybody. Um, I'm not going to read off slides, but I'm going to use them as notes. And I'm aware that in two minutes I will have forgotten somebody and forgotten their life work, and I apologize for that, but I'm trying to fit as much in as I can. So, what I wanted to do was, was kind of in a way go a little bit back in time, back to 2018 when we first started talking about the idea of a, a regional hub. Um, at the time, I was working on the Oxford University Planetary Health Programme, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, same as the Planetary Health Alliance. Um, and we started to have informal conversations really around the Edinburgh Conference in 2018 and the um, International Society for Infectious Diseases Conference in Vienna in 2018 um, about having some kind of, of regional hub. And at the time, the idea for that was that in, obviously, international travel is, is not the most sustainable thing in the world, and that we would move from having perhaps a US conference every other year, but regional hub conferences in the years in between. Um, the next one, which would have been in 2020, which we'd actually started to talk to, to Remco about the possibility of, of having it in Amsterdam, um, but obviously that got closed down. So at the point at which we were going to originally formally launch the European hub, um, lockdown came and we couldn't. And, and what happened in that time is that everything went online. A lot of the things that we had been talking, the, the kind of meetings, um, started to go online. And the interesting thing for that is it kind of washed away the idea of international borders. So a lot of them, as we were trying to expand the network, make connections, we found that we were making them outside of, of our European region. So we worked very closely with Melvin in Kenya, um, with the East Africa hub. Um, there was a, certainly a group around Germany. Um, Oxford had an office in Berlin at the time, and we talked about around the, the World Health Summit with the, the German group. But we started to almost go a little bit more subject-specific, and it's been interesting as we come out of lockdown, seeing how that affects the activities of, of both sort of the individual members and actually the group members in the hub as we go forward. Um, there's continued to be very close links with the East Africa hub with quite a lot of the European members. There's also been a focus on mental health, which has been led by the, the Climate Cares team at Imperial. And there's been a focus on education and capacity building in particular. And I think one thing that we realized is one thing that Europe has is it has a lot of capacity, a lot of capability, and also a lot of more easy access to funding than perhaps some of the members in the other hubs have. So that actually what we can do is we can look both at trusted partners around the world. We have connection through the Planetary Health Alliance, but also there's an opportunity for them to come to us with projects they would like to get funded, which are very much coming from their needs in the Global South, that we can perhaps help them to get funded with. And to me, I see that something as a real value and perhaps a real way forward for the European members. In terms of activity, virtually the minute that, that lockdown ended and, and borders opened up again, we were all desperate to meet each other in person. Um, we were trying to actually get an official convening at the um, World Health Assembly in Geneva this May. It was a little bit too short notice, but we all went anyway and essentially had a party there. Um, and that was a good opportunity again to meet each other and um, to kick off that, that energy and that enthusiasm. Um, and then there was the more formal convening in Amsterdam again in September 2022, where a lot of the talk was around the strategy, how the hub would go forward, finalising some of the working notes of the, the different... Um, the education working group, the research working group, policy working group, the movement building working group. And it'll be interesting to talk to the other hubs about, we know the parallel conversations on those have been going on in their hubs. 
In terms of some of the specific activity, and I said this is where I really apologise because I know I'll, I'll leave out somebody and there's been some fantastic work going on. We've had initiatives said like the, the Climate Cares um, initiative around mental health led by Imperial, and they're now leading the, the COP2 European hub, um, which is essentially looking at mental health and climate change across Europe. Um, there's been the ISG in uh, Barcelona have been running workshop series online. Again, those have, although they're European, they've been open internationally. Anybody can log into those. Um, there's also been online seminar series and workshops by the German members. Um, and there's been a lot, again, of individual events, both online and in person, that have tended to actually have a more worldwide audience than would have been the case if we had, perhaps lockdown hadn't happened and we'd stayed more regionally based. Um, what there has been as well, as we've seen, is there are increasing numbers of universities across Europe that are formally incorporating planetary health courses and planetary health teaching um, into their curricula. My own job title is now officially lecturing global and planetary health. I did want to put planetary health into the title of the courses that I convened. The university wasn't quite ready for that yet, but I think it will come. Um, but we're seeing University of Exeter has grand challenges with planetary health in title. Brunel does. I'm less aware of some of the ones outside of the UK, but we know that's growing across Europe. And so that actually seeing planetary health embedded into curricula is interesting. And what I'm also very aware of in, in the UK, which again I've, I've raised with the hub, is we also know that there are universities who are running courses with planetary health in the title, who are appointing staff with planetary health in their job title, but who are not members of Planetary Health Alliance. And actually finding out where those are and reaching out to them and bringing them in I think is quite an important activity. It tends to happen because we see them at a conference, we see something advertised, then we can go and, and talk to them. Um, but we actually need to be reaching out perhaps more formally, cataloguing those and then bringing them into the hub. Um, one of the things that we see as a real opportunity for growing the hub is, as has been mentioned within our, our hub convening meetings, perhaps piggybacking on national science festivals because this brings in not only the, the academic institutions, but also the non-academic institutions. And it was actually interesting with the European Hub convening in, in Amsterdam, because it fell at a time that was very difficult for academics to go. When we looked at the list of who was there, most of the organisations who attended were the non-academic institutions. And I thought that was actually really interesting, because perhaps they sometimes have less voice within the network than the academics. And although I wasn't there for the reasons it wasn't a great time for academics, I think that would be really interesting to see how that plays out. Um, we've been talking to the, the, uh, the University of Exeter in the UK, because the British Science Festival this year is due to be held in Exeter. And we think that offers a real opportunity to have some formal planetary health activity there, to perhaps have a summer school for students, um, to have more public activity, to bring that idea of planetary health into a, an event that will grab a lot of media attention. One thing we also found, particularly from talking to the ECRs when we went to the Geneva Health Forum, is that they feel that they have missed out over lockdown of making those network connections that they would expect to make at the beginning of their careers. And that's something that seems to be really concerning them. And that actually the, the Planetary Health Alliance as a network, one thing we think it can do is perhaps have a more formalized career structure for ECRs to be able to see what, what universities are involved in the network, to connect with academics who are working in planetary health. Um, and to help nurture some of those, those younger ECRs coming through. And that's really to help them to see a path from, even from high school through undergraduate education, to postgraduate education, to their first postdoc careers, um, into faculty positions at universities that, that understand what they're doing. Because certainly with transdisciplinary research, we've, what we find is a lot of ECRs struggle to kind of find their place because they don't easily fit into one discipline. Um, and again, that's something I see as a really important role of the Networks and Planetary Health as Alliance to bring that together. Um, so, said, I do apologise greatly um, for anybody whose work I've forgotten. Um, in terms of future plans for the, the networks, um, I, I won't be, or me and my institution won't be bidding to carry on leading the European hub. Um, unfortunately, that is dependent on European funding, which is difficult for us to obtain any more as the UK isn't officially part of Europe, so we will be handing on to somebody who's in a much better position to do that. Um, but there are opportunities, certainly, for, for us to certainly still, still stay involved. We have our own UK research funding streams. 
Um, we're happy to help to grow the European membership, particularly linking up with those groups in the UK we know aren't yet formally networked, but we think would be useful. Um, definitely, I see an opportunity for running both online and in-person summer schools and helping those ECRs through their careers. Um, we would probably like to look at a, a UK sub-hub, um, both for, for social activity, but also for linking up with some of those UK funding streams that are outside of Europe. So I say thank you all very much. It's been fantastic to be involved for five years. Um, it's a shame in a way to hand on, but I know the European Hub will grow, and I very much look forward to being part of it in the future. So thank you. So now I'd just like to move on. We're a little behind time, so for our partners will be presenting. We can keep to the three minutes. Um, and I'm excited to have these partners present because they have their own communities of practice. And we have a shared goal. And we want to make sure that we're not working in parallel, but that all the hubs I've just presented, whether you're in person or online, if you see opportunities, and so as the partners present, if you can share perhaps if you have ideas of opportunities or if you think there's areas of collaboration from what you just heard. But let's start first with Anya. If we can switch back to the Zoom. She's on Zoom now. And Anya is from the Falling Walls Engage Foundation. Yes, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope so. Yes, we can hear you and see you now. Nice. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks for having us here today. I'm here from the Falling Walls Foundation in Berlin. Also, my colleague Niklas is joining. And um, yeah, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our work and what we're doing. So we work at a project called Falling Walls Engage, which is a global platform for science engagement, mostly for science engagement practitioners. And what is science engagement? Some know the, the term as science communication or active science communication, some as public engagement in science. Um, for us, it's active involvement of publics into science through dialogue, participatory, or co-creative formats. And the goal is to create mutual benefit and mutual learning for everyone involved. And the impact that we want to um, achieve in the next years is to improve trust in science on a global level. We want to um, have global societal challenges addressed and shaped in a participatory way by science and society. And we want to have long lasting improvements on people's lives through fact based decision making. So we also started uh, building a hub network, which is a nice coincidence. So it's not a difficult term to remember. So we started launching the Falling Walls Engage hubs all around the world starting in 2020. We now have nine active hubs in um, yeah, across the globe already, we just launched our latest one in Japan two weeks ago, and we will have another hub launch this year in South Africa at the end of November. We do have regional and local hub managers who are basically running the hubs, and we at Falling Walls Engage bring them together in our global platform. So the idea is to foster the term and the idea of science engagement all around the world to um, bring in different perspectives from uh, the different regions and bring them together, see what works and what doesn't work, bring together the best practice and see the value of science engagement for society and global societal challenges. The goals that we have are for once community building. So we build a community of science engagement practitioners as we call them. Um, we do have a, a community of over 3,300 uh, community members now in 142 countries. And um, yeah, we're right now at the moment or at the point to see how can we transform our community platform into an action platform. So we had the first year this year, we were really focusing discussions and debates in our hubs on planetary health as well. And we want to shape um, or yeah, we want to see how we can transform our community towards planetary health and how science engagement can be an angle and a solution for different regional um, challenges on planetary health. So this is where we're standing right now. Um, I was very happy to be involved in the European hub convening in Amsterdam already and already um, we were thinking about a lot of um, collaborations. We, uh, I'm joining the 
um, movement building group, which is really a great fit. And yeah, we're very much looking forward to see where we can do other collaborations, especially with all the regional hubs uh, that we have and that the Planetary Health Alliance has in the future to see um, what can science engagement bring to the table and how can we yeah, be part of this very great network. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anya. Next is Marta, who's also online, Marta Lomazzi from the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Thank you, Jeremy. It's my pleasure to be here connected online to briefly present uh, the World Federation of Public Health Association. This NGO was founded over 50 years ago uh, to bring the voice of health professional uh, to the global level, to the WHO, UN, and other international organizations. We are made by about uh, 130 association members, mostly national public health association, and we represent roughly 5 million public health professionals worldwide. We are joining uh, this uh, network because we believe that there cannot be public health without the planetary health. We can bring in the expertise of public health professionals from around the world, we have public health association in every area of the of the world, and we have also uh, two uh, regional three regional federation of public health association that help, like uh, the the hub we have heard now, to bring the regional needs, the regional voice, at a higher level. We mainly work on preventing disease, promoting health and well-being through different approaches. And our main expertise in on, is on advocacy and policy, as well as in capacity building. Uh, our values and goals uh, find their root in a truly intersectoral world, which is in our mind very much needed to go through the different crises we are facing, including, including the, the, the environmental one, the COVID pandemic, political instability, and so on, all threats to the health of the world population. Um, I will be very much pleased to join the discussion today and to see how we can collaborate with the different hubs facilitating uh, knowledge sharing, uh, building links with our national public health association in the different parts of the world, as well as to consider the development of joint activities, joint advocacy together, taking advantage of the different strengths of the organization that are part of this hub. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. If we can actually move to Geo next. Hi, Jeremy, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you from ICFA. All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Georgia, and I work for ECLE, uh, Local Government for Sustainability, which is a global network of more than 2,500 local and regional governments around the world. And we focus on really uh, sustainable human development. Um, and yeah, the organization is 30 years old. And as I said, we are a global network, but we have different um, I'd be like the hubs of the Planetary Health Alliance. We have different offices all around the world, and I'm representing the European uh, office uh, today. Um, the actions we do is basically working with local regional governments on a series of topics. Um, it really depends on which regions you are in. Um, we have heard this also when <laughs> talking about the Planetary Health Alliance. There are like some specificities, uh, but more generally, uh, we really focus on anything that uh, in relation to sustainability um, and government. So what governments, local and regional government can do to improve their um, urban development when it comes to sustainability. Sustainability. So we do projects on energy, mobility and transport, infrastructures, circular economy, uh, waste, um, water, uh, and also um, topics like social justice and culture um, and food, uh, which is actually the topic I focus on in my daily work. Um, we really try to have an holistic approach. Um, and I would say, especially in the last few years, uh, we have been trying uh, not to really focus just on environmental sustainability sustainability, but also on social sustainability um, and bringing also health uh, into our work. And that's why um, we joined as uh, ECLA Global, uh, the Planetary Health Alliance. Uh, we really value partnerships. That's very important to us. Um, 
and so not just obviously with the governments we work with, uh, but also with organizations, uh, university all around the world. Um, in Europe, for example, we uh, work on EU funded projects. And so we always work in collaboration with a lot of different partners. And for us, it's very important to bring in the perspective of local and regional governments, uh, because we believe that, yes, we need change, uh, as we all agree. Uh, and the change happens on the ground and uh, governments that work more closely to with citizens and really see the impact of our uh, multiple crisis are the ones that really can make a change and also then influence a higher level of governance. Um, so we're also what we're trying to do, for example, at the European level. Uh, so we work with local regional governments, but we also try to make their voice heard at the European uh, level uh, in Brussels. Um, and this is very important to really mind the gap between the different level of governance. And I think this is very relevant also when it comes to planetary health more generally, as we have heard already <laughs> from the hubs. Um, and one thing I would like to share is that um, I think um, having the perspective of local regional governance is more important, a very important thing to bring planetary health ahead. Um, so I really invite uh, people to get in touch uh, with the specific um, a office that we have in different parts of the world. Obviously, myself, I'm very happy to get in touch with people that works in Europe, and I'm part uh, as a representative of ECLA of the European Hub, but I think it would be good uh, for everybody to get in touch with us because we can really bring in uh, the local and regional government's perspective. Um, and more specifically for our case, uh, we work on food quite a lot uh, recently, and food, as we know, is a very big contributor to climate change uh, and also uh, health, uh, unhealthy, uh, let's say, lifestyles. Uh, so I really invite you to learn more about us and you can just go on our website, which is www.eclay.org, um, uh, where you can find then, you know, the access to all the other um, regional offices. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And now for those that are online, I will post some links in the chat uh, for you to investigate more if you're interested. And very happy to be here today, even though online, <laughs> which is a bit sad on on. Uh, a sad note, but at the same time, you know, we cannot always travel, as we said, uh, for also planetary health reasons. Uh, so very happy to see so many people also online joining the meeting today. Thank you, Georgia. And can we go back to the slides? Thank you. And Daniel Hart London, who's with us in person from Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Hi, can everyone hear me? So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Wellbeing Economy Alliance is a network of about 330 organizations and many more individuals uh, whose goal is to help convene, amplify, and catalyze widespread movements for a well-being economy, one that respects both the needs of humans and the caring capacity of the planet. So what does this have to do with health? Well, a lot of us are aware that climate change is affecting our health, no small part thanks to the Planetary Health Alliance. Well, what is driving climate change? And a growing number of scientists, health advocates, and other groups are agreeing that the fault lies in no small part on an economic system that routinely places the externalities, the costs of its operations, on people and planet unable to defend themselves. So we, we all think this is not sustainable, but neither is it inevitable. We want not an economy where well-being is valued for its contributions to growth, but for an economy that's valued for its contributions to well-being. We aren't simply here for letting the economy do the wrecking and then let the government try to pick up the pieces afterwards via taxation or remediary programs. We want the economy to do more of the work on its own part to help solve some of the critical issues of our time. And we think that working on economic systems change can unblock many downstream issues, among them planetary health, but also issues of social justice, racial justice, indigenous justice, and many other spheres. So what's our strategy for this? Appropriately enough, it's a tree, you could say. The roots of the tree are knowledge and narratives, um, where we're showing uh, through convening work done by practitioners that system change is possible. Um, the trunk is the power bases, of which the hubs are very important. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then the leaves, hopefully, are shifting power. Um, there are many groups that are working on individual components of economic systems change, and we'd like to think that we're one of the ones who are trying to think of things synthetically. 
So in terms of the power bases, uh, we have a certain initiatives on this. We have an initiative called WeGov, where we've worked with five different governments, including Finland and Iceland, to embed well-being metrics and initiatives into their um, budgets or their uh, everyday practices. But the hubs are really the key. We have eight hubs currently, California, Canada, Wales, Denmark, Netherlands, Ireland, New Zealand, and Scotland, and 10 more in development. And the purpose of these hubs, similar to the hubs of the Planetary Health Alliance, are to connect, uh, encourage connection, collaboration, and uh, convening of groups interested in economic systems change. And we think of this very broadly in terms of the actors involved. Um, you know, we really see that uh, many of our most important members are groups that are related to health. Obviously, uh, the Planetary Health Alliance is a member, but we also have the Swedish Organization for Global Health as a member, the Danish Committee for Health Education, uh, the European Health Futures Forums, and many others see that their cause is uh, inextricably linked to the cause of economic systems change. Um, and uh, an example of the good work being done by our local hubs is that of Scotland, uh, which um, we helped, uh, which we helped promote, uh, provided them with access to resources, uh, connected them to certain funders, and we were able to help them embed a national performance framework uh, within Scotland's government, of which well-being is an important part. Um, and currently, they are working towards self-sufficiency and hiring staff. Etc. And so we're looking to expand dramatically over the next couple of years. Uh, the important thing is less about the terminology used um, in Brazil and in much of Latin America. We don't necessarily use the term well-being economy, but the important part as we see it is to see that many groups across geographies and sectors see how their particular um, concerns can be aided by uh, promoting the cause of economic systems change. So with that in mind, um, we're very interested in learning from the hubs around here uh, about how you've approached certain questions that are vital to the operation of our organization's hubs as well. So within networks, how can our members help one another, not just through shared struggles, but through the specific struggles faced by different kinds of groups within the network under the idea of an injury to one is an injury to all. How can we help build the capacity of groups within our networks that might be of slightly different uh, thematics or organizational forms uh, than our own? And then how can we help people make the connection between economic systems change and other areas of needed change, just as you are trying to do in regards to health and climate change? How can we help develop a convergence of movements around these? And probably most importantly, what groups aren't here right now? Uh, what are the skills, groups with what skills, what resources, what knowledge, what experience need to be at these tables and need to be at these hubs in order to make sure that we have a fully representative and effective um, uh, organization uh, and be able to exert maximum leverage for the changes that uh, ourselves and our planet need. So answering these questions is difficult. It can be sometimes painful, but as long as we're speaking, then that's better than no conversation at all. So I'm looking forward to speaking more with you and uh, learning more about your experiences. And I encourage you all to go to um, our website, uh, weall.org, and to learn more about our initiatives. And we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you to all the regional hub representatives who spoke and our partners as well. We're going to, because of time, skip Q&A, but I want to offer you the opportunity um, to send me your questions. I'll put my email at the end, and then I can send them to the speakers that you want and make sure to connect you. So this is the probably the most important part, both for people in person and online. We're going to split out into breakout discussions. In person, at your tables, if there's not many people at your table, maybe join another table. Um, online, you're going to be broken out into breakout groups. And with time, we'll use 20 minutes for this. And to talk about these three questions, where is the energy in planetary health in your region? What are the strengths and weaknesses that you see around building a planetary health community? What are the challenges? And then question three, identify three things that would make a substantial difference for the growth of your hub. 
And so I know some of you are already within a hub, some are might not be in a hub, but the purpose of this is to learn from other people in different regions as we just have from listening to the other speakers. And if you can identify in your table and online in your breakout group, one note taker to go to this link or use the QR code where to fill out your notes and then we're going to compile all that together and synthesize it for you. So let's start. So we're going to do, we're going to extend this just 15 minutes if, if you're able, if you need to go somewhere, feel free. Um, but I'd love to hear a key highlight from each table. Uh, unfortunately, we need people to come up to this microphone so that the stream records it and the attendees virtually can see it. So if each person, if one person from each table can come up here uh, right now, that'd be wonderful to give your key highlight. Um, and then if there's any question for them, I'll walk around with my microphone and we can answer. And so we have 15 minutes to do this, so we have to be rather speedy. So let's start with the closest table. Who's the first person going to be? And everyone else from other tables, if your person is going to report back, just come up now so we don't have to spend too much time with walking back and forth. Hello. Um, so we are thinking that we have the knowledge, we have, the lo we have a lot of knowledge, so the, the Sao Paulo declaration that we wrote last year, we have like 17 different sectors and you know, all the directions. And so we were thinking that what is missing is to put this knowledge open, to spread this knowledge and to make it in action. So communication is like a key point. So we are, we are talking that uh, communication, the mindset of communication nowadays is kind of uh, very old fashioned. Uh, it's only like negative and you know, there are a lot of people all over the world already doing things in this direction and nobody knows about it because we are keep talking about wars and, you know, uh, of PB or economic growing or I don't know what. So this is one key point. That's to change mindset of the communication professions so they can start uh, spreading the words of what a good thing or positive things that are happening. Um, did I miss anything? Yeah, so thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll just, I'll be very brief because I completely support and agree with what the previous speaker said about communication. I think we talked about it, but from a slightly different, a slightly different angle. I think our, the key issue that we identified was the relationship between academic discourse and getting stuff done. Um, and that was really what we, we, we focused on. Um, looking at some of the work that's already going on at kind of the project level, particularly in uh, Latin America, uh, the, um, the Campus Ambassadors Program, which is currently operating in Brazil, but it's going to expand out across uh, the region. Um, and in our region, my Sarah talked about this a little bit earlier today, uh, basically some of the work that we're doing with, uh, with youth and with other, with other groups, um, where you're basically taking some of the academic discourse and translating it into uh, actionable programmatic work and change. Um, and also, as you quite rightly said, this issue of communications and trying to get the communications right, particularly with young people. Did I miss anything? Is that okay? Hi, everybody. So for our table, we just listed down things that we feel, we believe will really advance planetary health in our respective regions. Number one, the most practical, money. <laughs> but number two, planetary health-oriented leadership. We cannot just have you know, another clinician leading schools of medicine and public health, and we need political leaders committed to planetary health. So congratulations, Enrique, for, for Lula's uh, victory. I hope, we hope, right? <laughs> Impending victory, PH education. So seven out of eight people in our table are already teaching planetary health, including Barcelona's first ever master of planetary health in the world. And we need more in the years to come. Network that is led by young people. 
because they are the ones who will really dismantle the structures that perpetuate planetary health damage. Intersectoral collaboration, easier said than done, uh, including in academia, interdisciplinary collaboration, and continuous platform for exchange. Yes, we are here virtually and in person in Boston, but the exchange of knowledge and good practice must continue 365 days in a year. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Kirsten from the Center for One Health uh, with the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. So with our table, we identified four key areas of discussion. So first, defining planetary health. How do we differentiate ourselves from One Health or how do we integrate the disciplines? Uh, we want to identify a toolkit to determine how we can be better practitioners for planetary health. So as other speakers have said, how do we translate the ideas into action? We also want to uh, decentralize this movement outside of academic set, uh, centers to bring in stakeholders from um, governments, economic sectors, and other grassroots organizations. And finally, on a more philosophical level, we want to think about how we can shift our value systems away from being solely human-centric um, to also having a value for greater ideas, our uh, role in well-being, environmental, and animal health. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing good. So what we discuss on in our table, we have the representation from the you know Europe, uh, the African, the American, Asian representation of the regional hubs. But uh, we discuss about the different uh, aspects, starting uh, from you know the first question. So uh, being uh, the representation from Pakistan, I find that Asian regional hub representation is quite not you know good. So we have the Europe representation from the Belgium and the Italy. And they told us that they didn't have the you know a much uh, richer background, so the guys should uh, ensure the youth leadership. There should be increased youth leadership. There should uh, be the community engagement, in particular in the concern of the planetary health. And besides that, we have to build the community. You know, we have to focus on the courses first, the introductory courses. The easy to digest courses, we can have a better engagement with the public. You know, it can involve the different sectors. The other thing we, we, we are discussing the fact that we should uh, increase the community building of the planetary health so we can have the greater social media representation of, of the respective regional hubs so that we can have more engagement with the public. We can have the highlighting of the activities, you know, the, again through the social media, and we can have the open call for the membership. So yeah, this is all we have discussed, and we are looking forward to a much greater youth uh, impact and leadership. Thank you. Anyone else? Is that all the tables? <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Um, I think I have to tell you something. First of all, a disclaimer. This is my first time here, so I don't believe, believe, uh, belong to a region or whatever but I have tried to listen very carefully. Three topics. Money, money, money. <laughs> the reason why I stress this, um, I come from Europe, and we are fortunately enough that we have a European framework program, which is about 17 billion euros for seven years. So we have access to money, and we can work with that. We are doing that, and that I think we, have, we are fortunate enough to, to have that. I'm very critical about Europe, but this is one of our assets. We have the money available. As long as you write the good story. That's what was mentioned before. I think the storyline of planetary health should be more emphasized, more improved to explain, to understand to everybody, and not solely the people who are here in the room. Um, 
What is also important for that is that we have been discussing the topic of education training. What I have been missing a little bit in the presentation and what we discussed on the table, where are the flagships of the Planetary Health Alliance? What I mean with that is what are projects which everybody recognizes this is what it's all about. And I think that's very important to have. You can call them flagships, you can call them lighthouse projects, but this is how you sell a story. Because you need to sell the concept of planetary health. We talked about returning back to nature, but then we need to explain why we have left that and why returning back is a good idea. Storyline, communication to all stakeholders, and that was also a little bit what we discussed on the table, at the table. This is not only about science, I'm sorry to tell you that. This is not only it about politicians or policy makers. This is not only about society, but it's also about industry. And I know they are the elephant in the room, but if you do not convince industry to join the movement, you will never get there. And I think that's also important. Last remark on education and training. It's very simple. If we say, in a region, we want to train X young people, let's say each region, 10,000 young people, what do we need for that in terms of resources to do it? But if we manage to do that in five or four years, then you have so many ambassadors running around that the story will grow in itself. Thank you. And we just have one last point from online. If we can switch to online. Uh, yes, I can, I can share that for the group. <laughs> um, I'm not going to repeat uh, some of the things that have been said already. Um, I, th I just thought that there was one point that was not mentioned by uh, the other groups, which was languages. Um, because coming from the European hub, we can all agree that we have a lot of languages in Europe and that can be problematic, I think, um, but also something we should invest our time in because if we want to bring people on board on, on this topic, we cannot just speak in English. Uh, we need to acknowledge that if we want to really reach people, we need to understand there are different languages and really think how can we work with different languages and how can we expand our networks in order to utilize those members that have the possibility to reach people in their local language. I think this, you know, applies to Europe, but applies everywhere. We talked about it uh, also for the Latin American side. Um, so I think that's something that we really think about. We need to think about because um, I know English is uh, our common language is great. It's good for science. But then it can also be a barrier when you want to bring people on board. Um, also, if we want to go beyond academia. So that's just a point from our group. Thank you, Georgia. And can we switch back to the slides, please? So I sent you the, well, I didn't send you. I put the link on. But this QR code, um, for people who did write notes down on just a piece of paper or just notes not in the form, that QR code goes to a Google form. And it's important because we actually want to collect everything that you all talked about. Because if Tulsi in the back, she can wave her hand, Tulsi Modi, who's been helping with the regional hub program, she's going to be helping develop more concrete information for us to develop a needs assessment for the regional hubs, just taking this information and further so we can further see how the Planetary Health Alliance can can move these hubs forward. Uh, because as you saw, some of these hubs are up and running, some are new, and some have yet to actually gotten started yet. So that's really important if you've taken notes. Just to close, um, once we have, well, it's lunchtime now, so <laughs> you're invited to join the Travel Scholars for lunch in room 214 uh, to continue these discussions or get to know them more. Um, on November 2nd, we'll have a regional hub related event called Regionalizing Planetary Health Case Studies from the Field. So I invite you to attend that at 9.40 a.m. And you can learn more about regional hubs. That's very dark, but if you go to our website and go to our network, there's a tab for regional hubs and you can go there to learn more. And I invite you to join the regional hub community. You can join the global community, but then there's an um, online network for Hilo. There's a community for each as well. And finally, if you have any questions or 
anything at all about regional hubs, you can contact me in my emails here as well as online. So thank you. I know this went a little farther past time, but I appreciate you taking the time to discuss this and move these hubs forward. Have a good day.